Here we are again. This next panel is filled with superstars and guarantees to be a riveting conversation. I'll turn it over to Jen Bug of Brown and Crouppen Law Firm and sponsor of this conference to introduce our next panelist. Hello and good evening, everyone. Brown and Crouppen has been a sponsor, a proud sponsor, of Webster's DE&I conference for several years. I'm so glad to be here on behalf of the firm to introduce this panel, Challenging Racism in Media and Arts. On our panel today, it'll be moderated by Art Holiday, who is the news director at Channel 5. We have Kofi Coleman, the president and CEO at the Muni. Vanessa Cooksey, president and CEO of the St. Louis Regional Arts Commission. Michelle Lee, news anchor at Five on Your Side. And Paul Steger, the dean of College of Fine Arts here at Webster University. Take it away, Art. <laughs> well, I guess I'll take it away. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was asked to m make a brief opening statement, and then I'll introduce uh, our uh, panel. Actually, I guess we don't really need to reintroduce them because we just introduced them. Um, so let's begin with for systemic racism and social injustice to be eradicated. Media and the arts can have a critical role in creating an equitable society. Following the high profile deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and other black people at the hands of police, media and entertainment companies have started to take a stand against systemic racism. There's a growing understanding about addressing the absence of people of color in positions of power in media companies. I work for one of those companies, Tegna. During much of 2021, Tegna provided a mandate and training for its 64 TV stations to hire with diversity in mind and enact inclusive journalism standards to report with the intention of reflecting the entire communities that they represent. In our newsroom, we have a director of content who supervises broadcast and digital. The next level of leadership is me and Ann Stegan. I supervise the broadcast side of our newsroom and supervises the digital side. Prior to 2021, when a Vietnamese American was hired as our morning content producer and I became news director, our newsroom management team was all white. And all that is the context for me becoming the first black news director in the 75 year history of KSDK. So what does that mean? It means I have an opportunity to serve our newsroom and our community. It means I play a key role in mentoring, coaching, recruiting, and hiring. And it means doing a good enough job that it won't be 75 more years before there's another black news director at a St. Louis TV station. So what are we doing differently at KSDK? We recognize that mugshots live online forever now. And so we created a mugshot policy when we use it, when we don't. Without specific criteria for the use of booking photos, we risk reinforcing stereotypes and doing harm to people who may have their charges dropped or who may be ruled not guilty. So if KSDK is not going to cover a criminal case to its conclusion, we don't use the mugshot. We've made it a priority to tell stories that more accurately reflect our entire community. And we've developed multiple ways of tracking our storytelling to hold our newsroom accountable. We recognize that our viewers may have a story to tell, but they don't understand how to pitch a story to a te television newsroom. So when people write to me at newsdirector at ksdk.com, they receive an automatic response, which includes instructions on how to pitch a story. Who, what, when, where, why? Why will the audience care? What happens next? What are the video possibilities? What's the contact information for people that we might need to interview? 
That's what some of our newsroom uh, has been up to during my 14 months as news director. So let's begin uh, the, the conversation today. Uh, my colleague, Michelle Lee, is an anchor and reporter at KSTK, five on your side. The Washington Post knows about Michelle, so does <laughs> CNN and Yahoo. And it wasn't long ago that Michelle sat next to Ellen DeGeneres for an interview. <laughs> all because a KSDK news viewer left Michelle a racist voicemail without realizing who she was dealing with. <laughs> so Michelle, how many times have you told your story? I feel like it's countless now, really, but I'm honored to tell it. Um, but now it feels like I'm telling it to somebody else, or telling it about somebody else, really. And it's only been maybe, what, eight weeks? Uh, eight weeks that you'll never forget, right? Right. So for, <laughs> for members of the audience who aren't completely up to date, tell us what happened. Um, I was working on New Year's Day, which is um, kind of a, a slow news day typically, um, but we had just this one story, and I don't want to say it's a throwaway story because none of our stories are throwaway stories, but it's one of those stories that you see a lot on New Year's Day that just says, um, Americans eat this uh, for New Year's Day. So I said something like, Americans eat pork for prosperity, greens for wealth, uh, cornbread for coins. And then I ad-libbed a line and said, well, I ate dumpling soup for New Year's Day because that's what a lot of Korean people do. Just very short, maybe 30 seconds total. And uh, a couple of nice uh, messages came through that just said, hey, that was really cool that you mentioned that. Um, and then I got a, a a voicemail that changed the trajectory of, I think, my life, really, um, where this woman called and said, I was really offended that Michelle said that because she was just being very Asian and she needs to keep her Korean to herself. If a white anchor talked about what white people ate on New Year's Day, they would be fired. So it was just really annoying, and please talk about what white people eat. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> and so um, I shared that on social media, and it, it went viral. It, went, it was insane how viral it went. Um, and uh, we made a T-shirt out of it. We raised money for the Asian American Journalists Association. And people from all around the world are wearing our shirts right now, from Holland, Canada, Korea, Australia, Germany. Um, so it's been quite a moment. And then I went on the Ellen Show. She gave us a gift, or she gave me a gift, um, and we decided to turn that into the Very Asian Foundation based in St. Louis. So, Michelle, I had a front row seat for some of what you went <laughs> through, but not all of it. Um, I mean, you were being pulled in a lot of different directions. Uh, this became an international story. Have you had time to sit down and kind of process what happened? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people say, oh, I bet it slowed down for you. But really now it's ramped up exponentially because we have this foundation work to do. So we're building a plane in midair. We've got bylaws to create, a board to expand on. How are we going to... Um, Come up with fundraising. What's our mission statement? Who are we going to help? You know, all these things so that when you donate to the Variation Foundation, you need to know exactly where your dollars are going, all these things. On top of that, um, we're getting ready for May, which is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And so a lot of ERGs are saying, hey, can you come speak to us? <laughs> so it's been really great, um, a little overwhelming, but um, I have not had time to process it. I think maybe when I'm really far in the distance, I'll be able to process what happened. But that's okay. I mean, we just kind of wing it every day anyway. <laughs> well, I think I'm speaking for our entire news organization, but I'm certainly speaking for myself. The, the classy way that you flipped the script on this was phenomenal. Um, when we're in the public eye, like Michelle and I are, you get all sorts of feedback, and, and some of it's unpleasant, um, as you found out, as I found out. Um, and my first inclination is to uh, lash out. <laughs> but the, the video that you did, if you haven't seen it, look for it online. But you hear the, the caller leave her voicemail, 
And Michelle, you were sipping a cup of coffee, weren't you? Mm -hmm. And just kind of, you know, the look on your face was priceless. You didn't say a word, but the, the, the reason it went viral was the way you handled it. And that was a big part of it. And then uh, obviously we, you know, we just heard the rest of it, but um, you know, we, we celebrate you at KSDK. Uh -huh. Um, we don't really care to be the story, you know, we're, right. we're old school, we like telling the story, so it's always uncomfortable when you become the story, but yeah. uh, well done. Oh, thank you very much. It's, you're right, it is hard to be the story. I mean, it, it's one thing when you put things out on the ether and you think that you're never going to hear anything. I knew what I was doing by putting it out on social media, but I thought it would have the same the same 10 people interact with my content. You know, I really didn't think that it would get outside of those boundaries. And so then it really did become uncomfortable. Like, wait, now, wait, people see this? And it was, pretty much, it was pretty much overnight, wasn't it? It was overnight, just a matter of hours. You know, I went, to, I went home at 10.30, 11 o'clock, and woke up in the morning to a different world. So um, it, was, it was fast, and, it's, and that kind of stuff is terrifying. I, I've never been viral like that before, and it, was, it started to get really scary. I mean, I was scared at first, like, oh man, am I gonna get a call from Art? <laughs> am I gonna get fired? <laughs> I did get a call from you, but it was really nice. <laughs> you know, because that's when you start going, oh, did I go too far? Right. I was really nervous about it. That's quite a story, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Vanessa and Quofi, you represent two of St. Louis's most significant arts organizations, the Muni and the Regional Arts Commission. Um, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, the arts have the ability to bring people together. But when there's turmoil in society, it's often artists who use their talents to shine a light on what needs to change or to hold the powerful accountable. Would you share your thoughts about those roles? Vanessa, we'll begin with you. Thank you so much, and thank you all for having me. Thank you, Vincent, for this invitation. And the role of the Regional Arts Commission, we are the largest public funder of the arts in St. Louis City in St. Louis County. And for the last 36 years, we have invested in artists and arts organizations that make our community vibrant and thriving. St. Louis benefits from one of the most creative cities in the country. Cities twice our size don't have the arts community that we have. And what makes that special, not only is the environment in which we create for our residents to experience new stories, new narratives, and to challenge, but also people who come to St. Louis to visit. More people come and visit our arts and culture than all of our sports teams combined. If you look at the impact of our economy and jobs, and when we talk about who St. Louis is, it's the creatives, it's the artists that tell our story, that challenge, that help us to heal. How many of you benefited from an artist during the pandemic when we were all on lockdown. I know I had a neighbor who got his guitar out, went out in his front yard and just played for us, right? It's the music that soothes our soul. It's the storytelling that brings us together and Rack is so proud to have a front row in investing in that creativity and holding ourselves together and accountable through storytelling and narrative. You know, uh, for us, for the Muni, it's our job to be a platform for those artists, right? We have to, we have this megaphone because we're the oldest, largest outdoor musical theater in the world, right? So um, with that comes the responsibility to make sure that we're a megaphone for everybody, you know? So how we tell those stories, who tells those stories, who's at the decision-making table about which stories are told, those are all responsibilities that we hold, that we have. So um, as, a, as the first black president and CEO, I, I take, bring my identity to that job and say, well, who am I bringing along with me to make sure that when we pick a season, when we read a script and decide what should be in it or not, it's taking into account every perspective that's in this community so that when the audience comes and sits in, they all see reflections of themselves on the stage and in the process. And it's not an easy thing to accomplish. It's not a wildly diverse 
um, industry from a leadership perspective right now, but it, it's something that, uh, you know, I, you, you talked about not being the last, same thing. I have to do a good enough job to welcome more people that look like me or that look like all of us into that conversation. But the, the job is to use our platform to welcome more people, a, a broader, broader representation of St. Louis. And, I, and, you know, we're taking those steps. We haven't nailed it. We have not been perfect in the past, but, but you know, that's why we're in these, these conversations. So when I was a brand new reporter in Oklahoma City in 1977, uh, fresh out of college, and I'm in the break room at the TV station in Oklahoma City, and a coworker that I had never spoken to asked me if I thought I was hired because I was black. And the short version of this story is that I told him, go ask the news director who hired me. Um, now, that's a, that's a conversation that I've replayed hundreds of times, and I wish someone would ask me that now. I'd have a lot more to say. Um, so I'm wondering, Vanessa, have there been incidents of racism in your past that's been part of your journey that maybe either uh, was a, a roadblock or fuel to succeed? Definitely fuel. Um, I uh, am fortunate I have an undergraduate degree in film and worked uh, for Cartoon Network and CNN in the early parts of my career, and so I'm very fortunate. When I started my career, it was in, a, in Atlanta, a very diverse community, and there's never um, a time in a professional environment where you don't meet someone who sees your packaging first. And I think for me, it has motivated my commitment to excellence in bringing people along and not making that the first thing. Sometimes I don't make my race a big deal, and so when other people do, it's like, I know what I said just made sense. I know it did. It's like, oh, you're, you're caught up in the packaging. Oh, okay, got it. Um, <laughs> Don't worry about that. I'm telling you, this is really going to work. Um, so, but I also don't deny, you know, being black, female, young, the only one. And my commitment is to bring others along, like Kofi said, so that it's not uh, novel. It's it it's part of who we are. Like this room is the standard. This room reflects, and who's with us online, reflects this world, reflects this country. And what I try to do is encourage, if you're in a room where there's, everybody looks alike, you should be uncomfortable. And recognize that something is going to be missing. The conversation won't be as robust as it could be. The solutions won't be as impactful as they could be when we're not present and inclusive. So I, I definitely use it for fuel and try to create the environment where I know creativity can thrive. Paul, um, my boss recruited me for this particular position of authority, uh, an inclusive hire that gave me a leadership opportunity. Uh, and KSDK is being intentional about cultivating leadership roles uh, for people of color. What are some of the things that need to happen for more underrepresented people to have decision-making roles of power in media and arts organizations? That's a great question, Art. Um, That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I have a little byline in my signature, in my email, and that is try never to be the smartest person in the room. And if you are, you should invite other people or find another room. Um, and I think that the only way that you can open that table to more people is by identifying them uh, or, or welcoming them into that room and giving them the opportunity to be at the table. Um, it goes back to a, um, a, 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 um, a book I read on Creat Creativity Inc about how Pixar started and that a number of the production personnel that were doing the animation and everything else were not in the room with all the big decision makers. And the key part of how that thing was gonna get made was to have those voices in that room. 
And that was how those voices got elevated and amplified. It's exactly what you're talking about. You have to find a way to, to amplify it. You've got to invite more of the people in the room. You've got to change the way in which you do search processes for faculty and for staff. You've got to open up those things. You've got to reach out. I mean, we, we started a thing in the College of Fine Arts that we have to have an, a diversity advocate on every search committee that is going to be make sure that we have a large enough diverse pool that everyone is represented in that pool um, and that we can't just, well, we searched this way, you know, 20 years ago, let's just keep sending, we'll get the same results every time. And um, so it, it's also opening up those doors for people to have associate chair roles, uh, be a department head, um, finding those ways that empower them. Um, but also being, being cognizant of the fact that you have to put in place support systems that also advocate for them while they're facing a variety of different challenges. Um, so, you know, I, I do the best. I just call it, it, it's a journey that we're on. Not, not to say that there's some vague destination out there, but that this is an ongoing plane that we are building in the air and, and we have to keep building it, and it's got to be big enough to invite and, and incorporate everybody in that space. Kofi, I'm wondering if are, you probably play a role in hiring at the Muni? <laughs> uh, every, a little bit. <laughs> I would, yeah, I'm, I'm a master of the obvious. So um, what is your strategy and thought process uh, when it comes to hiring? Uh, blow up your Rolodex. You know, that's that. I mean, Rolodex is a really old term. I don't think anybody's uh, <laughs> using one, but with your phone book, whatever it is, you know, you have to stay. We all start with who's comfortable and who we know. But if that's what we do, then we can end up with the kind of room that Paul's talking about. So I try to look for people that are smart but never agree with me. You know, um, I think I'm smart, but I'm not the smartest one in the room, and I, and I need opinions that differ from mine. And then it's, you know, you look at a totality of a team. You know, you're hiring a position and several people are qualified for it, but how do they fit in? What do they complement or not complement in the rest of your organization? You know, so, and I, and I try to take a 30,000 foot view. At the end of the day, if I looked at my team in like a room like this, how do I want, does it, does it feel representative um, if, if they're, opinions or stance could, could be represented visually, would it still be a good rainbow? You know, those are the questions I ask myself when, I, you know, when I'm hiring. And, and, you know, it's a tough thing because um, it's hard to find people that don't agree with you but still to bring them into your team and say that I'm going to, every day, I'm going to welcome this challenge into my reality. But that is the best way to end up with diversity of thought at the table. Vanessa, the Regional Arts Commission, uh, and I know from firsthand since I'm a, uh, sometimes I'm a documentary filmmaker who is, I don't even know how many grant applications I've made over the years. Um, part of your decision making is which artists get the money. You know, when you get that phone call or email saying your grant is, is granted, that's a big deal for, uh, for any artist, whatever their uh, you know, particular talent happens to be. So would you talk a little bit about that decision-making process in the, in the context of the conversation we're having today, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion? Absolutely. I am so proud to lead RAC. And we, as a public funder, bring the public into our decision-making process. All of our grants are reviewed by panel of diverse artists, non-artists, and that helps us make stronger decisions to ensure that the funds that we give to both artists and arts organizations tell a broad story. RAC has funded some of the largest arts organizations and smallest arts organization because we recognize and want to create a sense of belonging. And so it's not just the staff sitting in a room reading through applications. By far, we invite the public, everyday citizens in to read grants, to score them, so that when we make our funding decisions, they're reflective of the region. We truly are 
a regional organization that serves both the city and the county. And if you look at our history of giving and the humans that we give money to of the major funders of the arts, RAC is the only one that writes checks to humans. And I'm very proud of that because it's the artist, it's the creative that has a unique perspective and access to storytelling that benefits the entire community that we get to invest in that. And so when I think about RAC's contribution and being a public funder, it's because we really are public. So I want to give uh, the audience an opportunity. If any of you have any questions, please uh, step forward to the microphone. Uh, if we see someone come up, I'll, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to you, uh, whoever wants to ask a question. Um, so I want to share a statement from the leader of a prominent magazine. Uh, Anna Wintour, uh, editor-in-chief of Vogue, said, I want to say plainly that I know Vogue has not found enough ways to elevate and give space to black editors, writers, photographers, designers, and other creators. We have made mistakes too, publishing images or stories that have been hurtful or intolerant. I take full responsibility for those mistakes. Um, I'm wondering if, if you all would react to that statement. I'll start. Yeah. We have. Uh, we've made mistakes. We've told the wrong stories. We haven't invited the right people to tell the stories, and then we've reacted poorly when we were called on it. Uh, and that's something that, you know, we, full disclosure, you know, uh, we have to be able to own that on the front end. And I think when other people own that, we also have to create the space to not be punitive to help um, learn and move forward. You know, I have educated myself, I've educated my colleagues, our, you know, from a board level on down, we have those conversations, but we've, we've presented shows that, that uh, should have been retired long before. So I think that the major, major step is being able to look the world in the eye and say, hey, we messed up, we made a mistake, or we didn't progress uh, in lockstep with the world. The world has moved forward appropriately and quickly in the past five to 10 years. In institutes, when you're 104 years old, you move slow for a number of reasons, um, slowly. And so that's, that's um, just, we'll just leave that right there. Um, so there's a number, you know, so that, that's a reality, but, but we, we've done it. You know, I can think of shows that we, won't, that we won't present again, or, you know, and the other piece is we have to hold our partners accountable. We have, we have nine labor unions we work with. At some point, we have to set a standard for how representative those groups are as well, because they are a part of who we are. Um, and so you have to, um, the benefit of being our size and our magnitude is we also spend a lot, where we make an investment financially. So we have to be judicious in how that, that, uh, that money is being spent and say that part of our decision making process is how your group looks when you come into our institution. Yeah, ditto. I yeah. mean, made, made mistakes. Have to own up to that, yeah. right? Because otherwise, how, how do you help others acknowledge the fact that when they make a mistake, it's okay to say, I made the mistake. Now, how do, what do we do to fix that? And, you know, we, we've mo most recently had a show that we were going to do, and it did not work out the way that we felt like it should in order to move forward. So we stopped it, redid it, rethought it, remounted a new thing, which turned out to be a much more satisfying experience while it was a challenge working our way through it. It was, you know, it was just the right thing to do. The right um, thing to do is so, really important. Like, it's, okay, just, it's just right. It's going to hurt. You're going to feel do, bad. Do it, right? But it's, it's you know? the right thing to do. I mean, it's like it's when you're a kid and you have an accident with your car and you got to go tell your mom and dad that, I, you know, I knocked down the no parking sign or whatever. You know, you've got to own up to it because it's not going to go away. Right, because that, that's, that's what's happened for far too long. You know, we need, if it's uncovered, l let it be uncovered and let it find a new, a new life that, um, you know, uh, that allows everybody to move forward. And when, you're, when you take that kind of responsibility, then you're transparent about it and you also take ownership of it. And, and that's the only reason why people will begin to trust you. That's the only way. And, you know, I would, and thankfully, I think the world is less accepting for you to sweep it under the rug. Oh, gosh. And like you, because of the rooms like this, you can't do that can't. and not acknowledge it. And I think that that accountability is important, too. Like, we have to congratulate the room. 
we were talking about this before, some of these panels, you end up in a room like this, most of the people out here aren't the ones that need to be educated in it, but you're the ones that don't let everyone, that, that hold us accountable. You know, I'm, I'm me, but I represent a bigger machine than myself that doesn't always agree with me, but I can turn and say, look, if we don't do this the right way, this public, who is who we represent and who we serve, is not gonna let us uh, exist in the gray area anymore. And I also think that it's about word and deed. You know, oftentimes when crisis happens, we respond with statements, which are words, which are helpful. But then what are the actions that follow that? And being able to sustain that action, um, there's a radio personality, Joe Madison, and he says, what's the difference between a moment and a movement? And the difference is sacrifice. And this work is hard, it's a journey, it's, it's daily, that's just the nature of being human is managing a series of ups and downs, just like our heartbeat. And being able to stay the course, and when you mess up, you get back up and you keep going, it's sacrificing time, resources, ego, effort, to make sure that the statement that you put out, whether it was in 2014, 2019, you know, really comes to life as your lived experience. So it's matching that word and deed and sustaining it. I wonder about Anna Wintour as well, though. She's had this really great long career, but I don't really see her sharing the limelight with a lot of folks. <laughs> Can I just say that? I mean, as someone who's been you know, a reader of Vogue for many years and seen the, some of the decisions she's made, um, it's great that she says that, you know, but I do think that that's why representation does matter because people, I will say I've never had a, a manager or a boss who looks like me. That is okay because I just need people to lead with empathy. You know, someone who can say, oh, I know what it's like to be a parent of a new baby or I know what it's like to be a person of color and not hear your pitch, you know, that you're making. So, um, so I, I always am grateful to people who have listened to me and have been allies because I've never had an Asian American uh, boss, you know, so I am, I'm grateful for everybody and, and working together. But I do think that that is a very good example of someone who's saying this message, but not living the message, at least to my knowledge. I mean, there are a lot of things probably going on at Vogue that I don't know about, <laughs> I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, there were a lot of things to me going on in that statement, and one of them just reinforces the idea of how important images are, whether they're positive images, negative images, or omitted images, where you're not representing the entire community or a, a wide range of, uh, of people. Um, my brilliant idea just left, oh my. Um, I, I'm wondering if, um, because we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but the importance of images and representation. In my case, I hope there's someone who looks like me who may be in high school or college that now believes they can be a news director or a newscaster or a sportscaster. And I'm sure you all feel the same way. You want to inspire the next generation. But would you talk a little bit about the, the power of images, especially in the arts and media, because they are extremely powerful? Absolutely. I think that one of the things, and, and I appreciate so much about Michelle, in addition to the images, because people like to see themselves uh, in their stories, it's being able to communicate the feeling behind the images and why the story is so important. I was so moved when you shared your experience with us, but you also shared that when you went home, your husband hugged you, and you shared the impact of that experience on you. And that's what brings it to life for people. That's what allows the human connection. If all we saw was just the picture or the image, which sometimes social media limits our ability to say what the impact is, that limits our ability to move forward. So thank you for sharing the impact. Well, thank you for saying that. You know, it's hard because when something like that happens to you, um, it really takes you back years you know so it was like the six-year-old me going to school and getting you know made fun of from day one or like you know i had so many i mean i had a really great childhood in missouri there's no hand there's no question but there were these pockets where i was like oh it was so hard to date or it was so hard to make friends or it was you know always being othered or something like that and um 
I feel like so much of our adult lives are spent trying to correct what happened to us in childhood, you know? <laughs> it's like, if we could just prevent some of the childhood things from happening, we would just be more stable adults. Um, so the impact was hard. It, you know, at first I was like, I was ready to lash out. I was so upset. I wanted to kick her in her shins, you know. <laughs> I mean, not really, but maybe. And, um, <laughs> but you know, but, but really when it comes down to it, anger is just another feeling for hurt. And so I'm lucky. I, I can, um, I wasn't hurt. I wasn't, I wasn't physically hurt. I was safe. And I was in a safe work environment to where I could share those things. I mean, those are all privileges that I'm very well aware of. But it was hurtful. Um, and, it, and then you just start thinking of, like, I need to be better for my son, for the next generation. I don't want to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. So the impact is really great, even if it's just ideally something as small as being told that you're very Asian. But it was hurtful. It was really hurtful. And she was able to challenge racism. When we talk about the, the theme for this, challenging racism through arts and media, it's the pictures and the words. It's sharing the impact. It's sharing the story and allowing people to connect in a meaningful way that hopefully changes their minds and their hearts. You know there's a book in this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Art, you said you know, in the opening you talked about the, the changes you're making with mug shots. And um, how do I say it? it? That's like one of the most impactful things I've heard standing up here. Because the, when we talk about images and, and, and not just pictures of still images, if I'm, uh, if, if I'm not dressed like this, right, I'm immediately a completely different person to... Um, to a lot of people. I've run into colleagues, their families, board members, and if I'm leaving the gym, like they don't even know me, right? Like I'm a completely different, and so the point being is that like people don't realize how important it is for you to not show those mug shots unless you're following the story through to its completion because it, it changes um, how we have to move through the community every single day and all and all day and so I just think that you know I, I wish there was this opportunity where where I you could this is a bad there's a better version of a bad idea where you you know I can be this person or the same person in in, uh, in sweats and a hoodie because I'm going to the gym and you, and and somehow help people to see those as the same person over time because they they, they still just really don't you know. Um, and, and I, that, what you're doing there, I'm, I, in my mind, I'm trying to figure out what's the Muni's version of doing that. You know, for the best we do, the best we can do at this point is that we, you take the, the hero or the heroine or the princess or the prince or the king or whoever in a show, and you make sure that the, how they look, you, you spread the love across races or across different ethnic backgrounds. But um, that's, it, it, it's mind blowing to me still how much the uniform can affect the experience that, or, 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 the, or the input that you get. So I just, you know, I want to commend, you know, you don't need a commendation from me, but I just want to commend that move because it, it for a lot of people that are, that actually classify as young, I don't know if I make that classification anymore, <laughs> it's going to change uh, slowly, hopefully move the needle in, in how they get to exist, at least in this town. Yeah. There's a lot of power in art and media and how we hold it in its steam. And with great power comes great responsibility. And so you're taking responsibility for these images, if left unchecked, would have created an environment for mistaken identity and shaped his experience. Well, and you know, uh, the, the, I can't take credit for these three graduates of our graphic design program that got together over the whatever their, their eight years span between their their graduation dates, but they they did all the the graphics for the hashtag Very Asian Foundation now, so all of their stuff is on the T-shirts and everything else. But th they're looking at how do we, as young artists, support a foundation that's going to make it work, um, that's going to change, that's going to move that needle in a different direction. And, and over in the Hunt Gallery right now, <clears throat> we have a, a show by Mitchell Squire. It's called What I See, I Steal. And he's an African-American uh, photographer 
who has a, a large kind of um, curtain of images of the black male reclining because he said, you don't see that image very often. So for our students to be, and public to be able to go into that gallery and see a wall of this series of images is, should be, if it's not new to them, it should be welcoming, and if it is new, it should be welcomed, right? It's, it's how do you create an image or how do you support an image um, that's going to change the way people think. That when I walk out of the gym in my hoodie and sweats, they're not thinking about me. Yeah. Um, you know. Um, Kofi, I, I appreciate what you said about the, the mugshot policy, and I'd love to take, just take a minute or so just to give you some idea of how that process worked. We recognized that we needed to have a, a set of guidelines that allowed our uh, news producers and news writers to make an informed decision about when to use a mugshot and when not to. Um, in part because we've all watched enough newscasts to know that there's frequently a steady diet of mugshots. And many of those mugshots are of African American men. And in a city that still struggles with segregated populations, where you don't necessarily come in contact with people who don't look like you, if your only idea of young black manhood is what you see on a TV newscast, that can really skew attitudes. And um, stereotypes. So in that context, we formed a committee. And I did a lot of research because we, we were, you know, we were kind of late to the party on the mugshot issue. But the tipping point was websites. Because once a mugshot is on a news website or somewhere else online, it doesn't go away. So Someone could be charged with a crime, and a booking photo is taken, and a news organization uses it, and then someone could have the charges dropped, or they could, the conclusion of the trial, they could be found not guilty. But the mugshot still lives. So if that person who never went to prison goes to apply for a job, well, what employer doesn't go online and do some research on their potential hirees? What's going to come up? That mugshot. So we could actually do harm to someone uh, if we use a mugshot where we don't follow the case to its conclusion. So what were some of the criteria? That was one of them. Is there imminent danger to the public? You know, is there, is there, a, is there a gunman that's been identified that's still on the loose? Or are there potential victims of this individual who might come forward and testify or alert the authorities that they too were victimized by this person? Uh, you know, so there were, we probably had 12 criteria, but the, probably the most important one was talk to a news manager before you use the mugshot. So it, it becomes, now it's a conversation instead of just one person deciding that they're going to use the mugshot. So anyway, I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to kind of give you all a little bit of idea of how we went about it. It was a really thoughtful process, uh, probably took maybe five or six weeks, multiple meetings. Um, but uh, we hope that that gesture, or that, um, you know, those guidelines will make our news coverage a little more equitable for uh, people who are in the early stages of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, <laughs> applause is good. That's, um, what about retention of the people that you already have? I know um, one of my roles at KSDK now is to help create a culture in our newsroom that attracts people 
that we're trying to hire and hopefully makes them want to stay a little bit longer. Uh, so how do we do that? You know, we um, encourage people to have a voice. Everyone has a say in what we do, even if we disagree. You know, so if you have an idea or a problem or a disagreement or an issue, we can't deal with it unless you speak up. So you have, you know, you are empowered to speak up in our newsroom. So that's one thing. Training opportunities, mentoring opportunities. Um, and uh, regular meetings with a news manager so that no one's wondering what their status is or how they're doing. So those are all things that we're trying to do to attract and retain. And, and I'm wondering in the case of uh, Rack, in the case of the Muni, in the case of Webster University, when you get um, underrepresented employees, how do you keep them? And, what, and what's the strategy for that? We start with culture. Uh, we are very intentional about the culture that we're creating. And we asked ourselves, how do we want Rack to, what would, do we want our experience to be both as team members and for our grantees? And the word that we came up with is creative. That's how we want to be known. That's how we want to be experienced. And each letter in the word creative means something. So the C means connected. And not only did we define our values, but we have individual behaviors so that we know what success looks like or what, how creativity shows up and collective behavior. So we spend a lot of time ensuring that we're building the kind of culture where creative, talented people can thrive. We've upgraded our benefits and just being intentional, not just about inclusion, but a sense of belonging has been essential to rebuilding RAC and how we attract and retain talent. So culture is number one. Yeah, I mean, uh, it is, I mean, you, you try to find where, that's, where the support systems are not functioning. Um, and, and when it, it's an educational institution um, that, you know, traditionally has long-term members of the faculty. It's when, when the students come and, and tell me, you know, um, uh, not for us without us, right? Um, we've got to be a part of the conversation. We would like to see this needle move from where it is right now mm -hmm. to this level of inclusion. It's difficult when there are, I'm not saying it's not impossible, um, you know, it's just, it's a challenge when um, there's a long standing group of people that it's difficult to change what I would refer to as the kind of foundation of what it is that you do. But when when you're trying to change that foundation at an academic institution, you have to do that kind of surgically where you're putting things in the right place, you're building support systems, and it's not always perfect right off the bat, um, and we're still struggling with that, and we're still try, trying to find the best ways in which to support people so that we can keep them here. But the honesty and the culture of, of acceptance and, and welcoming of the challenges that they face and, and also that, you know, I'm sorry, that, that one or two or three individuals cannot now be responsible for all of our diversity, equity, and inclusion <laughs> efforts, right? Like, they've got to be on every committee, and it's just not, one, it's not fair, two, it, it just, it, 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 is, it does not help sustain them as, as members, valued members of our community. So, it's a long, we're working on it. You know, I agree obviously with with both statements. I think the uh, culture being top of that top of that list, but there's also that piece to, to what you just said, Paul. You know, so there comes a point where you have to say part of the culture definition is we're going to move out of the educating everyone about DEI issues phase into the action phase. You know, there are only so many times. And this is a, a, a phenomenal uh, um, conference that's been put together. It's very necessary. Um, but at some point, you say to yourself, when do we stop talking about it? Um, and when do we start doing, doing something? And, and in our institutions, how do we retain the, the people that are underrepresented um, by being upfront with the action as well? You know, no one is interested in, in too much of a, 
uh, a, a runway of lip service. You know, we all make statements and we all put out um, action plans, but what are, what are we doing about it? And that's what I've found, you know, and one of those steps is making sure if you have one, they're not one of one. You know, an action step, a true step is showing that, no, we are actively recruiting to populate this institution with the right mix of, of people. You know, I think a, a corollary question to yours is what do we do when we find that we have uh, and I don't say this of my institution, but I think we will all face it if we haven't at some point. When you have someone in on your team who can do their job, they have the skill set, but they don't believe in the forward thinking, or they don't believe in the progress that uh, we know is necessary. You know, one recruiting is another question. Um, repopulating is 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 its, is its own. You know, and and it's we carry our identities into this job. So if I find, if I were to find a person who didn't believe in the importance of DEI, and I, and I as, a, as a black man want to replace that person, is it an agenda or is it the, no, the, the right thing to do? Um, and so I, you know, Paul and I will have two different mm -hmm. sets of responsibilities to deal, or, or two different criteria that we have to make that statement based on. So I think there's, there's that piece of it. So. That's a long way to say culture, absolutely. But part of that culture is, is less conversation, more action. But we also have to tell our answer to ourselves, how do we deal with it when uh, we're just assuming everybody's going to buy in? They're not. Mm -hmm. um, I take it back, and, and the groups and the constituent labor unions that we work with are phenomenal. Uh, but they also have their own culture. They also have their own history. Um, and if I were to encounter one, and I have not had this case, I want to say that up front, but if I were to encounter one that says, you know, we're actually good just being uh, pretty homogenous. You know, we're good. We don't need any of that. <laughs> you know, um, what am I, what, what's my answer supposed to be? Because again, you and I can answer that differently. Um, so it's, if anybody's got great answers for that question, I'll be in the uh, corner after the, <laughs> after the session taking, taking those as well. Can I just say something though? I mean, as a, as a, someone who doesn't have to actually hire people, but who works as a worker, I feel sometimes I'm like, pay me. <laughs> That's how you retain me. Fair. Pay me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and you know, because sometimes I know that like as a woman, as a person of color, I'm not making the same as maybe other, my other counterparts and colleagues. Um, at the same time, I would be making more than others too. So I'm not saying that, but I'm just, you know, I want a fair wage. And then this realization that if I am a part of like the BIPOC group or the DEI group or whatever, you know, a lot of the work is outside of my regular work hours or a lot of the ERGs that I might be doing are outside mm -hmm. of my work hours. On top of the emotional labor of like just revisiting uh, racism and equity and all these things in a pandemic. I mean, I still have childcare issues. My kid's in quarantine, but I'm not in quarantine. It's still hard as hell to get to work. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just the reality. So when we look at equity, we need to look at like things all across the board and pay people for their, their time and their energy. And if you don't have the money, then find a way to get the money. Right. Because to me, I'm like, I will 100% like die on the hill of equity and I will work towards it, but then I go home and I'm exhausted, you know, and I've got a three-year-old who I can't be exhausted for. So I'm, I, I just want to say I'm thankful for my salary. <laughs> <laughs> Art hired me, by the way. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, this is what a lot of people are feeling. And, and I do feel like uh, in the BIPOC groups that I'm in, and I'm in multiple, people are like, I just I don't, I don't want to have to drag these people along because they don't want to learn. I don't want to I don't want to put this luncheon together because no one's going to show up, you know. So that's the next step, right, in terms of action. Um, yeah. But pay is good. Yeah, it's good this uh, how, how don't much, worry. What happens to Webster State? <laughs> 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 so it looks like we have a couple of questions. Uh, back to Kofi's point, and I know that that was, uh, you know, a challenging uh, you know place and you didn't really have an answer for it and so I'm following up with another question unfortunately but oh, it's um, a growing conversation in DEI spaces like at what point um, when you do have people that just you know will not come along in terms of DEI at what point can an organization say that's not a personality issue that's a performance issue. Mm -hmm. 
um, and one that there really needs to be some policy around and, and some action taken around. Um, if you know, for example, that somebody's habitually using, um, you know, sexist terminology to female coworkers, or if you have somebody that wants to use they, them pronouns, and somebody just outright does not respect that, um, can you talk within the context of your organizations of how you're making that um, transition from personality issue to performance issue? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the first step, well, I talked earlier about making sure that the decision-making table, decision-making body was more representative. And when you do that, um, all of the points you made stop being an add-on to what the, the culture of the institution is and just starts being ingrained in the job description, the mission statement, the focus points, you know, all of the terms that, uh, <laughs> that we use to describe how they all come back to culture, mission, focus, all that, it's the culture. Values. So values, thank you, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the other catchphrase. But you know, you start, right, uh, historically they've been kind of an add-on. You have to do your job. And in addition, you have to start to be more conscious of these things. So it's, it, the more we weave it into the definition of who we are, um, it stops being separate from, if, if, uh, uh, I, if our C CFO, and our CFO is a fantastic person, this is not her I'm actually describing. If our CFO was an excellent mathematician, but not conscious of the rest of the world, um, there was a point where you treat those things separately. You have to first weave it into the pure definition of what it means to be at the Muni. If you work at the Muni, you do your, the, the job you learned in college, but you also do the job you learned in life uh, and how you deal with people and they're, they're, they're hand in hand with each other. Because only then can you say that you are um, failing to live up to some piece of your expectation. So that's a long way to say that we, we move it away from an add-on. It's like saying, you know, we don't currently have a, um, a specific person whose job is diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I believe very strongly it's all of our job, you know? Um, and so I don't want to separate it out into its own thing. Now, there's a committee that makes sure that we're doing the right trainings and whatnot, but it's just, it's, it's all part of the same thing. So. Um, that's, that's the way we can answer it for our full-time staff. Now we bring people in seasonally from different constituent groups, and that's one of, that one's a little bit different because if I, if I contract with the musicians, I, I don't exactly know who all they're going to bring in, so we just have to say that we need your, your body, your group, to abide by these standards. It's very similar to when you do a, a project and you say, well, what, what's your, the contractor? What, what, what's the makeup of your group before we write you a check? So you, we, you weave it into the culture so it's not a separate thing anymore. Uh, and then that's, then you're evaluating them as a whole person, not just on their, their objective skills, but some of those things that feel a little bit more subjective too. I know it's not a, it's not a perfect answer because we're not perfectly there yet, but uh, those are the steps that, that we're taking. One of the things that RAC is focused on is capacity building for arts organizations and artists, and particularly for organizations, it's still an organization, so it needs the requisite financial policy, HR policy, and so we are doing the work internally so that we can model that, but we're also giving grants to support the general operations, and that's where you know the intersection of creativity, teamwork, and performance measurement happens, but unless you have those things documented and the infrastructure built around it on how do we measure performance, then it makes it harder to move people along up, out, around, um, so capacity building is really important, and RAC is definitely focused on that, particularly for our arts organizations. So we have some questions from uh, online viewers, uh, and uh, the first one's for Michelle. Do you, uh, did you, oh, I'm sorry. Microphone was over there, so I boomed. Oh, over there. I, then I saw this. That's young lady okay. Go ahead. So I boomed over. Hi, my name is Vivian Watt. I came out here particularly because I went to Webster in 1974, and I was in the dance department, all this good stuff, and I auditioned for the company, but. Um, the director at that time told me I could not be a member of the company, although I was talented enough, because my skin was too dark. He actually said that to me, so I ran through the dorms. I stayed, I stayed in Maria, ran through the dorms. But it was fabulous because he directed my career to go to SIU Eversville and work with Catherine Dunn. Mm. So there's a two sides to that, but I just had something to say. My, um, I work at Better For Me Life, 
and for the media. I had three young African-American males who participated, and they got the Arts and Education Council Award for keeping the arts happening. Not a single television station came to say, let us interview them. This is something positive in the African-American community, especially for those three young men who are high school students. Nobody ever reached out to say anything about them or ask, can we interview them? Can we put them on the station? But we see a lot of other kinds of of similar or some things that might be considered inconsequential or you know what I'm saying? But I'm just wondering, when is the media going to change that? Then for Regional Arts Commission, I've been on a number of your panels. Um, I might have taught a relative, Charlie Cooksey. But, <laughs> but anyway, I don't know when the panels start again, but I don't know if they are really encompassing enough of the community to know that they should come in and want to be panelists. Got it. I performed at the Muni also. And I did Showboat, when you're talking about some shows you may never do again. In 1993, we did Showboat. And there's a song in there that says, ba da ba da ba boom, Mississippi, da 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 And the word is the N-word. All work on the Mississippi. I refuse to do that because I have children. I said I will never get up there and do that. And we had to fight for them to change it to colored folks work on the Mississippi, colored folks work. So I'm just wondering if that has actually evolved since my kids do perform at the Leshen Stein Plaza or whatever, and we do community access. For all three of these organizations on the stage, I am hoping that the progress we are talking about here at DEI is not just a generalization, but it becomes more specific to the individuals in the community who are really the most important parts to make that whole. Thank you. Well, let, let me address the part about why there wasn't any media coverage, and I can't speak for any other organization um, other than KSDK, and I don't even know what day that was. I guess my question would be... It was at the, it was at the Fox. Theater. Okay. Yeah. And um, was someone handling publicity for that event? Did we did we have advance notice? I don't know. So that's if we don't know about it, we can't cover it. People automatically assume that if we don't show up somewhere, we've made a conscious decision not to go. We don't know everything that's going on in St. Louis. That's the reason, like I said earlier, that when people email me. I tell them exactly how to pitch a story to us. So I don't know if any of that information got to us. You know, so a lot of times people just assume that because there's a big event that everybody knows about it. If there's not some sort of publicity machine or if you don't pick up the phone or send an email, we may not know about it. To answer the, the, the question about the Muni. Uh, 93 uh, predates my, my first season there was 98. I was 16 as an usher. Um, so it was, uh, I had zero decision making power at that point. But to your point, um, Showboat, when I talk about shows that we're never going to do again, uh, so long as I'm in, in A or the decision making chair, it's, it's on that list. I will say that there's, a, there's always that challenge of what, when is a story important or not important to be told and what, what do you have to uh, what can you change or omit without um, affecting the historical significance? Now, that show in particular, uh, I believe that there's just not a necessity anymore. I can tell you that we, we have a really extensive script review process now. Um, when we, before we determine a show, you know, I know everybody does a survey and that kind of helps pick the shows, but the reality is we have a good idea um, going ahead because you have to start that process. So there is an extensive script review because at the end of the day, nothing on that stage should, um, we're here to tell stories, not offend. We're here to represent history, but not represent hurt. So there's a balance there. Um, so I would say that, you know, I can, I, I can own that the institution made a mistake then that I couldn't do, but I think we can feel pretty confident that that, that word's not going to happen on, uh, and I say my stage just uh, for the context of this answer, but that's just not a thing we're going to do. Um, and anybody that doesn't agree with that might end up in that group we were talking about formally of how do you deal with them when they don't agree. Okay. We just <laughs> opened our grants for program support and artist support. So please visit RACSTL.org if you want to be a reviewer. We welcome you. So thank you for, for serving and for all of us, the 
process is online, so RACSTL.org. I think we have a question in the middle of the room. Yes, just um, very quickly. I just want to first say that it's so nice to see someone who looks like me up there on the stage. <laughs> it's been a message here in this conference for the last two days that representation matters, and it really does because it's, it feels great to, someone, to see someone who looks like me up there. Uh, my question is, of course, for Michelle because um, the process of cultural assimilation for like people like um, I am, personally an immigrant of the United, um, from the Philippines, and I've been here for like 10 years, but for the most part, I've had to go through that process of cultural assimilation, and you've just had to blend into the majority culture, and now you've started the very Asian, um, you know, um, movement, and where do we start that process of reclaiming our individual identity and be seen and be heard and be proud and in our case, be variation. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, well thank you so much. There's so much there. Um, you know, for me, I am also an immigrant because even though I am a transracial adoptee, I was born at a time um, where we had to immigrate and become naturalized citizens. So I'm a naturalized citizen. Um, and I feel, and I also helped my sister from Korea immigrate to the United States as well. So I know a lot about just that process and how long it takes and then, when my parents adopted me, my white parents, they also were told by the adoption agency to assimilate Michelle. Mm -hmm. So those were actual terms that we had, the parents were used to and the API community especially. Um, so it is hard because I've also gone back to Korea several times and every time I go to Korea, I'm reminded that I am not Korean by culture. <laughs> you know, I'm very, I'm always like, oh, I need to get back to America. Like that. <laughs> I, mean, I love Korea. I love Korea. But you know what I mean? It just reminds you, oh gosh, you know, I've got the best of both worlds in many ways. Um, so that's why I liked Very Asian and, and just to see how people took off with it because it was a sense of pride. You know, for the last two years, we've said, stop hurting us. Um, please stop attacking us. Please listen to us. Please see us. And then in 2022, on New Year's Day, it felt like we were saying, you know what? We're going to eat our long noodles. We're going to eat our dumplings. And we're going to celebrate it. And not only that, but because of, I think, the being in the Midwest, Midwest Asians have their own thing going on. We're not West Coast, you know. And then on top of that, because I have um, this um, adoption experience, because I have a son who's mixed race, um, I had a lot of people in solidarity um, also reach out. So I think that we have to look at the Asian community and remember that we are not a monolith. You know, we have different cultures, some use chopsticks, some don't use chopsticks, some have, you know, we have so much to celebrate. Um, so it's really about reclaiming our, our, our uh, cultures and then also how it looks like in St. Louis. For example, it just, and Art's heard this a million times, it bothers me to no end that we had a Chinatown in this city for a hundred years and no one can t knows what I'm talking about. You know, like if you talk about Hop Alley, people are like, what is that? And, and, and even some of my friends who are Asian, you know? So I, to me, it's like reclaiming history because we existed in this space for 100 years, 20 years after Missouri became a state. We need to right these wrongs. We need to celebrate our history because this is Missouri history, not just AAPI history. So um, yes, I'm on the kick to reclaim, um, but also just to understand that we all have our own experiences and we all have shared experiences. When we walk out, on, when we walk out the door, people see the packaging, right? So we have to celebrate the packaging, but also it's individual packaging as well. So we're going to end with a couple of online stories that we have here. Uh, Michelle, uh, they want to know if you met the woman who left the voicemail. <laughs> I did not meet the woman. We said we would meet um, when it's COVID safe. It goes to show really that racism is complicated. You know, we had a conversation and I felt like I needed to protect her in some ways because um, when it was getting really big and I just felt like there's no reason that she should lose her job or her livelihood or be afraid to speak out loud because someone might recognize her voice. Um, she apologized, I accepted, but it's complicated. Um, but I don't really believe in cancel culture because I'm afraid that when I make a mistake, I want to have the grace and the forgiveness as well. I won't make a mistake like that, but, <laughs> but we all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. 
And uh, we'll end with this question um, for the panelists. How do you create a safe space where you teach people when they've made mistakes rather than banishing or canceling them out? Well, I think you just I mean, you kind I mean, of addressed it. I think Michelle just ad but addressed it. But you, you, you accept an apology and you put yourself. We are, we are all fallible human beings. We will, we will make a mistake, maybe not to that magnitude. Um, and I think that you have to ask yourself: Are you interested in something punitive, or are you interested in, in progress? And that's that's the that's what I. I to, I challenge myself with, uh, you know, you said earlier, sometimes you just want to lash out. Yeah, absolutely. But um, am I trying to make so that person, that person's still going to exist on the planet. Am I trying to keep them from doing it again sometime when I'm not the other side of it? Yeah, so you got to um, grace, you know, you got to enter it with a little bit of grace. Totally. And, you know, and I think that oftentimes, you know, people will recognize that they made the mistake and then they'll say, I apologize that you felt like I made a mistake, right? Which is the non-apology <laughs> apology. Yeah. Right? So there's a problem in the semantics there. So it's, it's, it's about helping them understand that while they, they're apologizing, what does that actually mean for them? And it's literally helping to teach them that moment of this is what it should, not necessarily like this is how you should feel, but this is what, what it is that you are doing how it's impacting others. Um, and I think that, that's, a, that's a fresh space to, to walk into as opposed to you did something wrong and you know, yada, 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 yada. It's just sort of like think about how this might be reflected outside of that message that you sent at 1.30 a.m. last night mm -hmm. and, you know, in the TIS. But, but also don't send messages at 1.30 a.m. Schedule them. But, 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 you know, I just want to say, like, you want to, you definitely don't want to cancel a group, but, like, there is an edge, too. Yeah. Like, there's only so many. You know, you, a, a repeat offender is a repeat offender at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah, cancel's not the right word, but you have to say, okay, you just, you're just not trying to be better. But mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how much more I'm supposed to do about that. And one of the things that, you know, when we talk about safe spaces, experiencing art together can create an environment for a conversation for healing, whether it's a performing art, visual art, but, you know, when, where there is conflict, allow art to support the healing process. That's a great point. That's the best one. Well, <laughs> I'm, better I'm still a work in progress when it comes to the leadership thing. And what I found, because this kind of, falls under the, the larger umbrella of uncomfortable conversations, right? Um, and those conversations, you know, may be generated from a lot of different things, could be behavior, uh, you know, could be a lot of things. But eventually, you have to talk to your boss or supervisor. What I try to do um, is count to 20, <laughs> first of all, um, to calm down whether, you know, if, if if tensions are high, to manage myself. And the less I know or the less comfortable I feel dealing with the issue, the more I reach out to get either my, my boss's opinion, what do you think about this, how do we handle it? You know, it's kind of a guy thing to want to fix things immediately. And that doesn't work when you're a leader. That's probably the worst thing you can do is to hurry up and try to fix something. And I've learned that the hard way. Um, you know, so in my case, I try to be as thoughtful and strategic with before the conversation takes place uh, and then, you know, try to handle it the best way I can. Thank you all. You've been great. Well, clearly, clearly we could continue to listen to you all af all afternoon, but we're going to... Could you really? We really could. <laughs> but again, a thanks to our outstanding panelists. Thank you so very much for sharing your stories. We're going to take a quick break and see you all at 3.30. Thank you.